This is to welcome you to the MPC, to the reading of the monetary policy statement for December 6th, 2023. My name is Kenneth Egesa. I'm the Director of Communication of the Department. I'm going to introduce uh, the members of BOU management that are here, starting with uh, the Deputy Governor, Mr. Michael Ating Eko, who's in the middle, uh, Dr. Twine Manzi, who is the Executive Director Supervision. Uh, on the extreme left, on the extreme left, and uh, next to me, Dr. Adam Mugume, who is the Executive Director Research. Uh, our program for today, we will have first the reading of the statement by the Deputy Governor, after which we will take questions from the media in the room and questions from those attending through the various uh, online platforms. Without further ado, I'd like now to invite Mr. Michael Atini Ego, the Deputy Governor of Bank of Uganda, to read the statement. Mr. Michael Atini Ego, you're welcome. Thank you, Director Communications. A very good afternoon to you, our viewers and listeners. Uh, you're welcome to the reading of the monetary policy statement for the month of December 2023. On 6th December 2023, the Monterey Policy Committee, MPC, maintained the central bank rate, CBR, at 9.5%. Inflation continues to moderate, reflecting the tight monetary and fiscal policy, good crop harvests due to improved weather conditions, relative exchange rate stability, as well as the declining global inflation. However, headline inflation increased slightly in November 2023 to 2.6% uh, from 2.4% in October 2023, while core inflation remained unchanged at 2%. The decision to keep the CBR unchanged reflects the MPC's assessment of the inflation outlook in light of the incoming economic data. The medium-term inflation forecast for December 2023 shows that inflation outlook remains unchanged compared to the October 2023 round of forecasts. Inflation is projected to remain uh, below 5% in the near term, but return to the target in the medium term. Indeed, core inflation is projected to average 25 to 3.5% in financial year 2023 stroke 2024, up from 2.2 to 3% in October 2023 forecast round. The upward revision for FY 2023 stroke 2024 reflects a higher path for energy prices in the short term. The inflation outlook is, however, subject to elevated risks. On the upside, the current geopolitical conflicts could escalate and feed into higher international oil prices passing through to domestic pump prices and renewing supply chain disruptions. Furthermore, volatility in the global financial markets could increase, triggering an increased outflow of capital and exacerbating the depreciation of the Uganda shilling. On the downside, global inflation could decline faster leading to much lower imported inflation. In addition, the current rains could result in bumper harvests, pushing down further food crop, no, the food crop prices. Since the last MPC meeting, the near-term economic conditions or growth prospects remain broadly unchanged. Although the domestic monetary conditions remain tight, the current investment activities in the oil and the gas sector 
higher regional demand for exports at the back of expected higher growth in most of the sub-Saharan African countries, resilient remittances and tourism inflows are expected to support economic growth. In addition, the will support a recovery in household incomes, sparing consumer Indeed, the composite index of economic activity a high frequency okay, in economic activity grew strongly at an annualized rate of 6% in the three months to October 2023. Economic growth is projected at 6% in the fiscal year 2023 stroke 2024 and increased to between 6% and 7% in the medium term. Economic growth is projected at 6% in financial year 2023 stroke 2024 and increased to 6% and 7% in the medium term. The growth outlook is, however, subject to uncertainties, including slower than expected global and regional growth, a resurgence of supply chain distortions if the geopolitical tensions escalate, tighter fiscal policy, in part due to unfavorable global financial markets, which could restrict government development expenditure, tighter credit conditions, constraining household consumption and private sector investments. Although the outlook for both inflation and economic growth is favorable, the MPC noted that inflation has bottomed out with significant uncertainties in the horizon. Therefore, keeping the CBR unchanged is necessary to anchor inflation around the target in the medium term, while at the same time supporting growth in private sector investment and socioeconomic transformation. Consequently, the MPC decided to maintain the CBR at 9.5%, the bonds on the CBR at plus stroke minus two percentage points, and the margins on the CBR for the rate discount and the bank rates at three and four percentage points respectively. As a result, the rate discount and the bank rates will remain at 12.5% and 13.5% respectively. Further monetary policy action will depend upon the incoming data and the evolving risks. Th that marks the end of the reading of the monetary policy statement for the month of December 2023. Thank you for your very kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Governor. We will now go straight into the question and answer session. Uh, when I call upon you, please uh, mention your name, the media house you're representing for, for our record. So who's ready to go first? Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's go online as you sort yourselves out. Okay. Uh, I can see from online that uh, some people didn't hear the last parts of the statement. I think we were muted or something. I think the very last paragraph. <laughs> um, would you like me to repeat the yes, last please. paragraph? Yes, please. Yes. 
uh, viewers and listeners, I am made to understand that some of the audience did not uh, get clearly the last part of the paragraph of the statement. So I'm going to repeat. It read as follows. Although the outlook for both inflation and economic growth is favorable, the MPC noted that inflation has bottomed out with significant uncertainties in the horizon. Therefore, keeping the CBR unchanged is necessary to anchor inflation around the target in the medium term, while at the same time supporting growth in the private sector investment and socio-economic transformation. Consequently, the MPC decided to maintain the CBR at 9.5%, the bonds on the CBR at plus drop minus two percentage points, and the margin on the CBR for the rediscount and the bank rates at three and four percentage points respectively. As a result, the rediscount and the bank rates will remain at 12.5% and 13.5% respectively. Further monetary policy action will depend upon the incoming data and the evolving risks, which marks the end of the reading of the monetary policy statement for the month of December 2023. Thank you. Deputy Governor, I'm sure that the, those who missed the last part of the statement have, have got it. Okay, so we'll jump back into the questions and answer sessions. I have a question here online and um, it is from Samuel Setumba. Uh, the question is... Um, what do you envisage will help anchor the 6% growth seeing that monetary policy remains tight? Um, Samuel, um, as usual, thank you for your very insightful questions. And I think that's a very good question. Yes, monetary policy remains tight, but there are a number of factors which are going to support the 6% growth. Uh, in the economy. And leading in this is the uh, foreign direct investment into the oil and the gas sector with its spillover effects to the broader parts of the economy. And also we have um, had a strong rebound in the exports driven by slightly higher export prices and also increased volumes. And we also mentioned earlier on that uh, the the rebound in the tourism sector, together it's with its spillover effects to the broader economy, including, of course, the government efforts to ensure that the disbursement of funds to support the parish development model is actually triggering activity at the bottom of the pyramid, including the small, medium uh, enterprises. So I think these are some of the factors which are going to support growth going forward. And also, note the fact that because inflation is coming down, the outlook is that this should spur uh, economic activity uh, because uh, we have begun uh, reducing the uh, interest rates and subject to these risks, we think that uh, if the risks do not materialize, certainly uh, we would continue on this uh, uh, trend. And... Um, also, the growth of the regional markets where most of our exports go, that is in the Sub-Saharan Africa, which accounts for about 50% of our regional uh, exports, or, um, is going to support the export sector. I think that basically is from how I see it. Maybe Dr. Damu has something to add. Uh, the, the only thing I can add on is... Uh, we are seeing better weather now, and uh, uh, we, I said uh, in addition to what the uh, governor said, we are seeing better weather now, 
uh, you know, the, the ongoing rainfalls, and uh, which could be carried up in terms of uh, agricultural uh, production. And I think we're already seeing this feeding through in terms of uh, food crop pricing. And we believe that the uh, agricultural uh, sector will recover strongly uh, in coming months. And remember that this also feeds into the industry as agricultural production increases. Also, uh, the aspect of uh, food processing improves. And I think the, these are largely the exports, uh, Governor said, are going into, some of these are going into the regional market. Basically, that's, I think, what I can add on in terms of, uh, in addition to what the Governor has mentioned. Thank you. Okay, there's another question online. Um, this is from Barbara Barunji. I'm going to paraphrase the question. So the question is, um, how is BOU foreign exchange policy shaping the exchange rate going forward? Um, and what are we intending to do on the exchange rate going forward, essentially? I think, uh, thank you for that question. Is it from Barbara? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the exchange rate remains market determined, and uh, this is supported by prudent uh, monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, because once you have imprudent monetary and fiscal policies, they spill over into the foreign exchange market. So uh, to date, we've had prudent monetary and fiscal policies, which have delivered lower inflation and also contributed to the stability in the foreign exchange market. So going forward, our exchange rate will remain market determined and Bank of Uganda will only, and in the unlikely circumstances, intervene if they need to do so uh, uh, does arise on account of very volatile conditions. So that's how I see it going forward. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Luther, the element in newspaper. Deputy Governor, I, I listened to, to your to your presentation and I picked some three things that maybe you'll have to address them. You talked of the geopolitical tension, then you talked about the volatility. And now this drove to the to drove you to, to saying the outflow, we shall have some kind it could lead to some kind of outflow capital outflow. So the question would be, what are we seeing? Are we seeing the capital outflow? How much is it, if it is real, if there is any capital outflow at the current time? Is there any, any problem with that? Are we seeing a lot of cap, capital outflow? Maybe compared to maybe a, a year ago, like the other year. And then again, when you did talk about, again, the, the tight financial conditions, and that maybe would lead me to interest rate. How, how do you view our interest rate really? Because people are still complaining that though the central bank has made a lot of uh, effort really to maintain the phys I mean the, the monetary policy at a, a fair rate, somebody used that word at a fair rate, meaning that <laughs> it is not so tight and not so loose but uh, the response from the market, meaning from the, the banks, it is not as fast as the central bank has done. So people are still worried of the high interest rate. And then again, we look at the, the depreciation of the shillings at the current time. Yesterday, by yesterday, when I was just moving around, I saw some boards were reading, I think, three eight hundred two. Do we think that the exchange rate could maybe continue to, I mean, the shilling could continue maybe to depreciate, although you said, yes, it will be market determined, which is always the case, but uh, the worry is, will it continue to be market determined like that in a weaker way, in a weaker way? 
Then you mentioned something about the growth. The growth you mentioned in the three months that I, that I looked at August and I looked at September, then I looked at, at, at October, which was 6%. And then the question that comes in, what drove that growth at that time? And what will it, will it continue like that? Will that growth really continue uh, at that same rate or there will be some kind of, I mean, a slowdown in the what? In the growth really. May I also maybe cross over to, to EDS and ask him some questions, which has always disturbed people because when we mentioned about the, 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 the capital adequacy of the, of the commercial banks, yes, the, the, rate, the capital ratio is okay, but we are wondering whether all banks really have now raised their capital requirement to the level that you wanted. When looking at it today, we are left with only six months to the deadline. So how are the banks really faring? Are they really moving towards that or there are some that are still struggling to, to raise that capital? Then Dr. Mugume, you will, I will ask you something to, to, to explain to us again, something about related to, to, to the regional, the regional, the regional input, the high regional input. When we look at the, the growth in the region, is it, it, is, it is anticipated it's going to be around 4%, is it, by the IMF, something like that? So the, 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 the question is, if the growth is expected to be around 4%, then what is really driving that high import level? What is the region? What is other countries lacking? The growth is there. Where are they going to get the growth from and when their import is going to be high? The level of import is still high. I think that's just quite a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the questions. Much appreciated, Martin Luther. Okay, um, let me briefly look at uh, what you raised directly at me. So I'll be very brief in order to give time to. Uh, Twine and uh, Adam to respond. Uh, when you talked about the geopolitical uh, tensions, volatility, and the capital outflows, I guess you were talking about the uh, the risks to the to the outlook. And certainly, we are concerned that if you take, for example, the Israeli-Hamas conflict, if that were to to spread across the region, it is likely to affect the supplies of oil. Uh, you know, from the region, and that would, could trigger an increase in the oil prices. And if that one were to happen, the domestic demand prices would go up with the knock-on effects on uh, the broader prices in the economy. And the volatility that you talked about relates to the global financial conditions. Because if these continue to tighten, it means that it will become difficult to access financing externally, and if you were to do so, you would do so at um, a very high cost. And that would not really be helpful, particularly for financing government expenditures. And what is most likely is that government budgets will become constrained. And then also, those, that volatility could result in two uh, interest rates going up in the global financial markets, including by the advanced uh, country central banks. And once you do that, you are likely to trigger of capital outflows because there are some of these flows that are looking for better return. So they are the margin, investing in emerging and French economies and also looking at what's happening to the interest rates in the advanced economies. So their risk capital then might reduce and that will cause a capital outflow from Uganda. And if that happens, you are going to exert pressure on the exchange rate, uh, causing a depreciation. So that's what I meant by, uh, by those three issues. Now, in terms of the interest rate that you, that you talked um, about, yes, um, we have not reduced interest rates as much as we have, would have wanted. Remember, in my statement, I did say that although the outlook for inflation and economic growth is favorable, the outlook is clouded with significant uncertainties. 
and those uncertainties, I did highlight them earlier on. Now, if you were to lower interest rates in a situation where you have significant uncertainties going forward, in the event that those uncertainties materialize and cause upside risk to your inflation, then you have to have a rethink whether to raise the interest rates again. And therefore, that kind of up and down changes in the policy rate is not good for a central bank. So we monitor not only the outlook, but also we keep an eye on what is happening in terms of the outlook. Are the, and are the risks and uncertainties, are they increasing and they reducing? And that guides us. So that's what we call uh, incoming data that will also help us. On the exchange rate, yes, we have seen some depreciation in the exchange rate recently. But in the last three days, including today, we've seen appreciation pressures. And in fact, uh, today the appreciation by midday 30 was about 10 shillings from uh, the opening levels. So while the exchange rate had hit about 3,820 something, it's now down to about 3,780 something. So why is this happening? Normally in the second quarter of the financial year, which is the fourth quarter of the calendar year, we tend to see a seasonal pattern in the, in the flows we normally see stronger inflows compared to outflows and that should cause an appreciation in the unit but this time round we've seen a delayed onset of the appreciation pressures largely because the private sector entities have been in the fx market for a number of reasons including dividend payments purchase of inputs for their for their own production but as we head towards the, um, the, you know, the, the holiday season, we think that that demand is going to wane and the supply side might remain the same or even improve. So possibly we're going to see the appreciation of the unit going forward if there's no other attendant risk. So the market rate, the exchange rate remains market determined and that's why you see it moving from, from 3,750 to 3,830, now back to 3,780. So let me leave it at that and uh, ask uh, EDS to come in on question before uh, EDR comes. Uh, to any place. <coughs> So the question that uh, was asked is that have all the banks met the revised minimum capital given the June 2024 deadline, correct? Um, yes, largely yes. There are, there are about three or four that had to submit what are called capital restoration plans in which then we track how they are meeting, you know, bringing in the capital to meet the requirements. But generally all the banks are uh, are well capitalized and this will be of course reflected in the their financial statements at the end of the year when when they finally come out in April next year so you've got to understand that remember it was phased capitalization so the final target is 150 billion shillings for tier 1 in June 2024 25 billion for tier 2 in June 2024 and 10 Billion now, well, that has now since been amended by Parliament to five billion for the MDIs by June uh, 2024, and in between they had intermediate targets. So for the tier ones it was 120, for the tier twos it was 15, and then for the tier ones initially it was five, but now with the revised uh, uh, with the revised minimum that uh, Parliament subsequently approved. That figure has also changed, but they are, they are all fiscal compliant. So, we are the, the way we are tracking the banks is we ask where are you vis a vis where you should be by end of December, then where are you vis a vis where you should be by end of June. And my number of them are already at the June figure 
For those who have not, they have submitted what are called capital restoration plans, and on, what, on which on a monthly basis we track with them, you know, how they are complying and bringing in the money to ensure that uh, they, they meet the capital requirements. Okay, thank you, Tini. Um, Adam? Uh, let me respond to two questions. I think one was on interest rate and credit, and then regional growth. I do. about interest rate and private sector credit. Remember that in, a, in the first half of this year, that is January to June 2023, we, two, we saw two cases of private sector credit and interest rate. We saw both the demand for credit and supply either remaining stagnant or declining. And uh, that was, and also interest rates slightly aging up and I think by 20, June 2023, weighted lending interest rates was around 21%. So you had the, a combination of raw demand for credit, low supply for credit, but also slightly uh, rising uh, lending interest rate picking up to 2020, uh, 20, around 21% 20, uh, in June. We started using monetary policy, I think, in August. We used slightly in August by 0.5 percentage point. Then what have we seen since then? We see that uh, actual lending interest rates weighted now have averaged between uh, then and today. They have averaged around 18.8 percent. So which means that actually there's some bit of feed through from the monetary policy action into lending interest rates. Uh, secondly, we have started seeing a slight re recovery of demand and supply for credit. And I think you will see in the detailed report, we are reporting a growth in terms of both the demand for supply of credit. However, that said, we still see nervousness into uh, credit extension. We still t uh, see a, a bit of risk, uh, risks uh, being elevated and uncertainties also in lending behavior because also they are reading from the same script of global uncertainty and crowded environment. And I think that's where there's sluggishness in terms of, uh, so there's a bit of tightness in the financing condition. However, as I said, we are seeing an improvement on, on that line, both in the lending interest rates and also private sector credit extension. And we believe that this will be part of the story that is supporting Anyone? economic growth as, the, as, the, as the, the governor said. On the regional growth and imports, your question is the uh, growth is 4.7 uh, and then where I, I never got it collected. But let me, put, uh, under, let me say what I understood. In the African context, we see growth, yes, I think remaining between three and most of the countries actually three and four percent. However, for the African uh, continent as a whole, we see that actually most of the growth is within our East African region. We see countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, I think uh, those are the leading, uh, uh, and also Kenya. They are all growing in the range of 6% if you look at the regional economic outlook. So uh, where do our exports go? They go to, they say, actually I forgot to say, DRC, DRC, although its growth is slightly lower now, but it's one of the fast growing economies now in Africa. So the question, where do our exports grow, go? It is Kenya, DRC, and uh, South Sudan. But now Rwanda export our grow, uh, to, to Rwanda have recovered. So overall, that's why we are positive that, yes, with uh, some bit of recovery in our uh, regional block, we are likely to see more exports on that angle. I never understood what you're asking in terms of imports. As again, as I said, for these countries to go uh, to grow in the range of six percent, whether Rwanda, whether 
uh, Kenya or Tanzania, they have to depend on imports. And since we are the exporter to this region, uh, including DRC or even South Sudan, then we shall depend, uh, then obviously our exports and therefore uh, will, ex uh, will grow, live around their imports. So basically, I think that's, so they, our, our exports to the region uh, and the country, countries I have said, basically will feed into their import bill as you rightly put it. And I think, uh, I think that's the, those are the questions that I think they will pose to me. Thank you. Uh, I'll read uh, a question from Ali Twaha of New Vision on YouTube. So the first question is, uh, are there new strategies to existing policies being considered in response to recent economic developments? And the economic developments that he's referring to uh, is the planned establishment of a fixed income company. Uh, the second question is, uh, what are the main challenges and opportunities that the central bank foresees for the economy and the financial sector heading into the new year? I have asked Ali to clarify the question on the fixed income company, but um, I'll let you take uh, the questions as I wait for that clarification to come. Okay, thank you. Uh, since the question is likely to do with uh, uh, the challenges the financial sector is facing as we head towards the, the new year, I will ask uh, Twini to talk into that. And maybe, Adam, if there's anything on the policy front, macroeconomic policy front, we'll talk to that. Um, do, I still, do I still need to twist? <laughs> uh, so, what are the new strategies Bank of Uganda is considering in response to regulatory developments? I think the first question we should ask regulatory developments. One is that there is an increasing reliance on, on uh, technology and digital platforms to deliver services. So uh, in response, uh, with the, our strategy as Bank of Uganda, one is to develop cybersecurity guidelines and down the road those should then be translated into cybersecurity regulations to ensure that the conduct of financial service business over the, over the internet or digital media or digital platforms is uh, secure. That's the first. Second, and this ties in with the Bank of Uganda's role with, as the Secretariat of the Financial Inclusion Strategy, is, is um, the increasing need for unique services for those at the bottom of the pyramid. And remember, part of our mission is about supporting socioeconomic transformation. So our first step on that was the licensing of an Islamic bank, which is an innovative and more uh, of a uh, value-based uh, financial service. So the introduction of uh, uh, the licensing of a new Islamic bank and now the introduction, the possibility for conventional banks to have Islamic financial product windows is also going to help towards um, uh, the the whole financial inclusion uh, strategy and agenda of, of both of uh, the government. The other regulatory development that we view and for which uh, Bank of Uganda has responded was um, the, the 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 number of cases in terms of frauds which are not necessarily cyber related. And um, uh, Bank of Uganda has, you know, commenced discussions with uh, with the Bankers Association uh, to look into matters of conduct risk assessments, uh, how the banks manage social media risk. Um, uh, we're also looking at truth in lending, whether perhaps some of these matters are related to how the banks treat their customers. So we're, we're beginning to take on also a, a customer 
focus, not necessarily centric, but the customer focused perspective to how the financial sector is uh, regulated. And then, of course, um, uh, 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 lastly, uh, I wouldn't call it a new strategy anymore. You all require, you all know that effective 1st December, the early repayment fees and charges have been removed on loans in banks in Uganda. And that is part of the one of the many strategies we put in place with regards to the changes in the regulatory environment. Thank you. Dr. Twini, Adam. Let me just say one or two things. I think on macro front, you we cannot have economic growth and economic transformation amidst uh, rising, for example, inflation or you know. So the fact that we we are emphasizing to ensure the center or the focus of monetary policy or policies at macro front is to make sure that demand matches with the supply in the economy at any given time, so that you don't have a spike in inflation pressure. Because, as I said, there is no economic growth or social economic transformation unless you first handle the aspect of uh, macro stability enshrined in the price stability. And I think, therefore, that remains our focus. Whether today, whether tomorrow, that is the mandate of the central bank, and that will remain driving uh, the policy, whether next year or the year, the year after. So basically, yes, we acknowledge that we are living in a, an environment that is hostile with uh, overlapping shocks, whether wars, whether or whether ETC. So the question, therefore, under these overlapping uh, overlapping shocks, whether domestic or supply, ensuring that the demand uh, continuously matches with the supply it remains the focus of monetary policy. And I think even this uh, monetary policy statement basically is emphasizing that. Thank you. Okay, we will take one more and then uh, close. Um, please go ahead, Martin Luther. Let's come. <laughs> Doctor, uh, let me just draw you back to, to the question of uh, foreign exchange reserve. Where do we stand right now? Uh, is, it, is it growing or it is it declining? And that's because we really want to know that. Now, Dr. Mike, the reason why, why, I, was, why, the reason why I was mentioning that uh, much as the the central bank has what has re, has reduced the the its monetary policy, what I was drawing there was this: you know, people look at the the rate of the central bank when they look at it at nine point five percent, and then they look at the rate that is in the market. They say it doubles. That's what I was referring you to. <laughs> Yes, that's what I was referring you to. And then, uh, Dr. Adam, what I was meaning when I was saying that, yeah, the growth in the region is just likely, is just going to begin picking up in the, in the trend to 24, when you look at the focus. But you, you went ahead and anyway, you answered it. But what I was referring to, that growth, I was meaning that the growth in 2024 is expected to improve compared to what it has been now, and which you said, because of that growth, then our imp our import, I mean our export, will be needed on those other countries where we shall be benefiting from it. I think that 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 was where it was a bit confusing you. I think that's what that's why you are saying you didn't pick it. That's why I have to had to go back. To, to repeat that, but it's not a question. I was just repeating what I was trying to, to draw your attention to, how the, the what the central the central bank rate is, is being doubled when they look at it. They say, oh, it is nine, it is nine percent, and the other one is twenty one, just like you have said. That's that's the confusion in the in the market. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Martin. Which doctor were you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> I was referring to in the doubling, I mean, in okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I was wondering if we talked to you. Okay, thank you, Martin Luther, um, 
for that uh, question and for also the clarification on your earlier question. So I'll address the clarification on the question of interest rates. But let me begin with the FX reserves. Um, we have certainly been challenged with FX reserves, uh, particularly in the financial year 2022 stroke 2023. Um, this challenge has really come from the fact that our major sources of building FX reserves had in the past been portfolio inflows, which were coming to purchase Government of Uganda securities given the interest rate differential. However, following the onset of the inflationary episode worldwide, the advanced economy central banks began to hike their own interest rates. And the impact of that was not only a reduction in the inflation differential, I mean the interest rate differential, but also flight to safety, given the uncertainties that the emerging and frontier nations were going to have uh, on account of the uncertainties. So we saw a reversal of this portfolio flows, meaning that our capacity to rebuild reserves was kind of like constrained. If anything, we had a reversal of these inflows and which exerted uh, pressure on the exchange rate. But more importantly, the debt service has picked up quite significantly in the last two, uh, two years, two fiscal years, and going forward, it's still going to remain quite significant. We are now servicing debt on an annual basis uh, by close to one billion US dollars, and it's projected to rise uh, uh, to beyond that in the next two uh, fiscal years. So you can see that if your capacity to build reserves is being constrained by the reversal of the portfolio flows, and yet the demand on reserves on account of debt servicing is growing, certainly your capacity then to build reserves in this scenario is constrained, is limited. So we've had a slight reduction maybe not slight, but we ha we've had a reduction in the gross reserves from the highs of about 4.5 billion uh, around June 2022, somewhere there, to around 3.9 billion. So that partly explains why the reserves have come down. But going forward, we intend to, to, to do our best to maintain the uh, reserves at the four months of future import cover. And how are we doing this? Is by pursuing prudent macroeconomic policies, largely monetary policies. And we have done so by limiting our intervention amounts in the FX market. Because in the past, we used to intervene quite significantly in the market. Uh, and that was leading to hemorrhaging of our reserves. But because now we, have, we are pursuing a tight monetary policy that needs to intervene in the FX market and lose our reserves has greatly reduced. So that's what I can tell you about the reserves. Now, on your question about the CBR at 9.5 and the lending rates at 21, that is an old question, a question which everybody keeps asking. And I think the central bank has labored to explain this question in the past. But for emphasis purposes, there are many factors that explain the lending rates, of which only one of them is the policy rate. You need to look at one, the government appetite to borrow, first of all, from the same market. If you are issuing government securities to finance the government budget deficit, and let's say a one-year treasury bill is 13%, it is very unlikely that the commercial banks or financial institutions are going to lend Martin Luther or Cage at 12% because you cannot be any less risky than government. If anything, they are going to give you a risk premium that if I can lend government at 13%, Martin Luther, maybe I'll give you a premium of about 7% since I don't know much about you. So you end up paying 20. But also there are other factors beyond the government appetite to borrow money. If you look at, for example, uh, the, the non-performing loans that banks have had to provide for, especially in the post-COVID-19 era, 
where a number of loans became non-performing and Trina here does not uh, stand the idea of banks not provisioning for loans. They have to provision for those non-performing loans and that's the cost to them. So how do they recover some of this? They recover by adjusting their lending rates to recoup for that because capital is very expensive. So the, the aspect of non-performing loans has got to be addressed. And then you also have some borrowers who go to supervised financial institutions to, to, you know, for credit, and then they have issues of repaying, and then they run to court to seek for a court injunction. Now, court puts an injunction, which means that the capacity of the banks to recover or even to foreclose on the collateral that they had been given is now constrained since under you know, injunction. And you don't want to hear the amount of money locked up on account of injunction is mind-boggling. It is running into trillions of shillings, and these are deposits money. And you, Martin Luther Cage, cannot go to a commercial bank to withdraw 100,000 and then be told, no, we cannot give you 100,000 because so-and-so has not paid us. No, the banks have got to pay you your, I mean, on demand if you ask for your deposit. So they have to look. If this loan remains unserviced for a given period of time, Trina here will insist that you have to provide, if it's more than one year, you have to, to provide it at a loss. Now, how long have these guys waited in commercial courts to have this case, cases sorted out? It's more than one year. So look at the amount of money locked up there. It's, it's about five, north of five trillion shillings. And that's the process money. And then, of course, you have the culprit also, arrears payment by government. You have some suppliers who have supplied goods and services to government, but they are, their monies have been, been paid, either because the areas have not been verified or for another reason. So all those things are, are in there. Now, if you had borrowed money from a commercial bank for the purpose of you know, uh, supplying government goods and services and you haven't been paid, it means that loan is now a problem. So there are many factors that enter into the determination of the lending rates beyond just the policy rate. So we might reduce the policy rate, but as long as you don't address the structural factors, the lending rates will not come down at the same pace as the policy rate. I don't know, Adam, you wanted to address the clarification? Okay, we'll take the last one and then close. Some we rather not, I hope we do. What is the message, Bank of Uganda's message, to an ordinary Ugandan especially, as we end 2023 and as we go into 2024? People have been crying, money is scarce, things are expensive. What is your message as Bank of Uganda as we end the year and as we prepare to go into 2024? Thank you so much. I want to believe that we are all going to enter the new year, 2024, and uh, thank you for your question. So first of all, I would like to thank the people of Uganda for understanding that they need to lower inflation was a top priority for government, and as a result, we have to tighten monetary policy to not to bring inflation from the highs of 10.7% in October 2022 now to the law of about 2.6 in November 2023. Certainly that achievement has come with, uh, with a cost in that the monetary conditions have been tight, for which we appreciate. But like Adam mentioned earlier on, there was a need to, to, to equilibrate, to bring supply and demand in line 
so as to bring inflation to where it is. So going forward, our message is that the Bank of Uganda is committed to ensuring that prices remain stable so that uh, this inflation does not erode the purchasing power of the incomes of the people of Uganda. Because the higher the inflation, the lower the purchasing power of your incomes or of your revenues. So that is one uh, message. And then also we are committed to financial sector stability. We want to ensure that the uh, financial system is sound because we don't want a situation where you wake up in the morning to go to your financial institution and you find a placard on the door closed. So we are committed to ensuring that the financial system remains sound and stable. And we're doing all this because we want to support the government efforts of socioeconomic transformation by ensuring that, that we have financial inclusion so that the people at the bottom of the pyramid also benefit from being financially included. When you're financially included, it means that you have access to financial services. And not only access, but also usage of some of the financial products. We are beginning to see some of the products at the micro level, for example, micro savings, micro loans, and micro insurance. And once you do that, you are securing the livelihood of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. They can borrow money to expand on their businesses. They can also save in order to ensure that they, they ensure themselves against the vulnerabilities that they face should this materialize. And also when they take some micro-insurance services, you ensure that, uh, that you minimize the adverse impacts of unforeseen shocks. So our message the people of Uganda is that we are committed to doing all those things for the betterment of their well-being. And of course, to wish all the Ugandans uh, a Merry Christmas and uh, a happy 2024 as we work together to transform this country. Thank you very much, Michael. But before we go, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is the very last question. And it is, um, what is the latest update on the issues that put Uganda on the gray list of FATIF? I thought it was an important question for us to respond to. Okay. What is the latest update on the issues that put Uganda on the gray list by FATIF? Yeah. Uh, you can address that. I will, I will address that. So. So when Uganda was put on the, the grey list by FATIF in uh, February 2020, there were 22 outstanding action items that the country was supposed to address. As, as at the last face-to-face -face meeting with the FATIF in September 2023, all 22 had been largely addressed. Uh, this, this month, in the month of December, there will be an on-site examination by the FATIF team come and verify with Uganda that the actions and the explanations we've been providing are indeed true and would expect that the final decision on getting us off the grey list should be made at the next FATI plenary in February 2024. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor, Mr. Michael Ating Ego, Executive Director of Research, Dr. Adam Gume, Executive Director of Supervision, Dr. Tunemans Tumuwine. Uh, viewers out there for joining us. This marks the end of the reading of the monetary policy statement of December 6, 2023. Shortly.
Uh, tugenda kusunulira uh, ripota ya kachiko uh, akateste SMBNC mbi ketwa kazake ya monetary policy statement uh, na ripota je kafurumiza uh, uh, na ripota je kafurumiza uh, mwezi ogwe kuminevili bili ya bili mwezi satu okutuwa wamu akachiko kasa zeo okusiga za kama ino ketwa kazako area central bank rate kubitundu muenda na kubitundu utano ulichukumi a uh, kino kisinzi de kubanti enchuka chuka mendo je bintu yeyongedde a uh, okukendelera dalala olwente kateka ya bank enkulu ya Uganda awamu ne ministry ye byensimbi yeyongedde okunyweza a uh, ensasanya yensimbi okutwaliza awamu tulabye nti a uh, ne na makungula gabadde malungi olwembera yo buddo okoyongera okulongoka ate ne mpanyisiganya ya silingi ya Uganda ni sente za mawanga mala na yoye yonge de ukukida dala atene chuka chuka ya mendo jebi ntu mwusizo na yeyonge de ukukakana eda tula vienti alipota ya ubosi ya lazenti ya chuka chuka ya mendo jebi ntu ya, ya genze kubitundu kubitundu bibidi na utuntundu mkaga ulichukumi ukufaya bade kubitundu bibidi na utuntundu buna ulichukumi amwezi ogwe kumi omwako guwe de a Uh, kachiko weka kubye muto chimaso kala zenti okutuwa liza wamu uh, webatu nulida ente bileza nchuka chuka uh, yemi wendo jebi nchuka kugenda maso uh, techu use uh, mluchiko luno wajigira gira nyano luchiko kwa mwezo kwa kumi elabala ganti okutuwa liza wamu nchuka chuka wendo jebi nchuka kusigala wansi webitundu bitano kulichukumi uh, mumieze jija o maso uh, wetuna tukila uh, uh, mwaka bili abili uh, mwe bili a uh, bili abili mwe satu bili abili mwe satu bili abili mwe no kugwako ejja kuba ku bitundu nga bibili ne kitundu okutuka ku bitundu nga bisatu ne kitundu okutwaliza wamu uh, na ye akachiko ka, kalungamiza nti wadengo go guli gutyo bala banti enchuka chuka mendo je bintu eno eyinzo okweyongera ko wagulu singa obusamba obu, obu tuko obuli mawanga agenja ulo kuleta mu okuzingamya entambula ye bintu Echinzo kosa ebe ya mafuta Netu chila bila masundi loga mafuta Wano mu Uganda ya tu Ate nebala, nebala ambi kanti singa Nobu, Nempanyi siganya ya sente kukatala kensi yona Akona kuka inzo kosa um, e sente zi ingina mkwanga Echo nechongira kusedeba kwa silingi ya Uganda uh, Nebalu nga miati wadeongo kukuli kutio Singa nchuka chuka mejevi ntu mawanga gali ya mala na yeyo ngero kuka Echo tula wikanga chii nzo tu ya amba Okulaba nti nchuka chuka mendo jevi ntu mu Uganda Na yo e kila dala Ate akachiko kala zenti okutuwa liza wa mu Enkula akulana uh, mubiemfu na mugwanga Era na yote chuu senyo Bojigira geranya uh, kumwezi ogwe kumi uh, Ngabwe gwali Era nebalu nga miati okutuwa liza wa mu babala manti Enkula akulana Ejia kuwa mkute kasente mumafuta uh, Okwe yongira obwe tafu wevi ntubye tutunda Ebweru waka, uh, weru wa Uganda Na dala mawanga gato weto olode Ateno kutuwa liza wa mti Evyo bulambuzi na vyo vichai ingiliza dala sente Elevyo vyo vijio kwe sigamiru wako Okulaba nti evyo mkula akula na vyo yongira maso Na eno loku banti enjuka chuka meno jevi ntuwe gende kendera a, Amanyi gasiringi ya fe na vichive gainzo gula mkatale Evyo na vyo vyo yongire dedala okunyweze bwa Eda abakuru baku vye tochi maso Evala ganti ya mwaka guwe vye nsimbi guna ugetuli mugu na agendo kugwa Evyo funa vye nzo kubanga vipuze Evyo tundu mukaga bulichukumi Ate mumia keji onge satu maso Tujia kulia wakatuwe vye tundu mukaga na vye tundu musamvu bulichukumi Na ene bata angaza Nti evyo mkula akula nevyo Vye nza okujamu obuzivu Singa Ebi mkulu akula na mawanga gatwe tolode Ne mawanga gona monsi Bie kuba muko Ate obutam, obusamba tuko Obuli mawanga again singa mbumanyi Singa na bobu zingamia Entambla ye bintu Ate nebalambi kanti singa Ne government ye yongera Okunyeza um, Ensasa nya yensimbi Okusinzi nanga kataleke nsiko na wikana wakatambu de Echo na chochi inza Okukosam Ne wadengo guguli gutyo Aga, a, kachiko kata angazi zanti bobe baku batochi maso Nchuka chuka mendo jevi ntu Awamu nevi mkula akulana Bida gantu Uganda Eja kusigarange tambula Kulunji ila nebalambika Ndiye choche iva sinzideko Ukuleka kabonero ketuwa kazake ya central bank rate Kubitundu muenda Nobutundu 
no tun tun do tano bulichikumi. Ebyo, mufunze, ebyo demonstrate statement yomioka wa governor.